I noticed this morning that he is now the subject of a new Facebook group which is growing at an exponential rate called Nigel Farage for Prime Minister. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Are we having a good time? Yes. Great. Well, you know, 2011 was a fantastic year for UKIP. We nearly trebled our position in the opinion polls. The party is gaining respectability and credibility. And I thought one of the big moments last year was in March when Stuart Wheeler became our treasurer. What a good, positive message that sent to the outside world. And later on, later on in the year, Lord Alexander Hesketh joined us, which when you think he was Chief Whip in the House of Lords at the time of the Maastricht Treaty, wasn't bad either, was it? <laughs> but the real reason that UKIP is gaining in strength in the polls and doing better every single week in district and county council by-elections, and the reason we came second in the Barnsley by-election last year, and well done to Jane Collins for that fantastic performance. The reason, the reason we're doing so well is that we're right. Because for years we were saying this European Union will threaten democracy, will be bad for our economy, and is not a place we should be. And we've taken a fair bit of abuse over the years for that. We've been called all sorts of things, haven't we? Eccentrics, cranks and gadflies being some of the nicer epithets that have been used. My particular favourite, of course, is still fruitcakes. But all the while we were being told by the Labour and Tory parties, don't worry your pretty little heads, this is just going to be about free trade, it's just a simple tidying up exercise, there's no need for a referendum, all the while we've warned what this union would become, and today we see it for what it really is. Mercifully, in this country, we won the argument about the euro, thank goodness. Thank goodness. But we always said, we always said that Greece and Germany could never live and survive together in the same economic and monetary union. And I've done my bit in the European Parliament with my helpful contributions <laughs> on, a, on a monthly basis uh, to point out what was going wrong. But what have they done in response to the economic crisis? In Greece, Mr Papandreou, the Prime Minister, dared to suggest that the Greek people should have a referendum on their future and the bully boys from Brussels removed him and replaced him with a puppet Prime Minister, the man who had been the governor of the Greek Central Bank at the time when they fiddled the figures and joined the Euro. So democracy has been removed in Greece. Is it any wonder that 80,000 people a few weeks ago tried to storm the Parliament and it took 5,000 people to stop them? If you take away from people hope, if you take away from people their ability through the ballot box to determine their own futures, then I'm afraid civil disorder and violence is all they are left with. I'm not satisfied with that. The same thing happened in Italy. Now, Mr Berlusconi, what, what can we say about Mr Berlusconi? I have to tell you, he's never invited me to one of his parties, but there we are. <laughs> But Mr Berlusconi may well have been, may well have been towards the end of his uh, time, uh, but there on the day that Berlusconi went was my little friend Herman Van Rompuy, <laughs> who incidentally, you might have read, has just been reappointed for a further two and a half year term. And I was asked on Belgian television the other night whether I regretted what I'd said about him two and a half years ago. And I said, actually, I said he would be the quiet assassin of European nation-state democracy, but in fact he's become rather noisier than I'd predicted because he was there on the day that Berlusconi fell and he said now is not the time for elections, now is the time for decisions, and they also got a puppet Prime Minister in the shape of Mario Monti. I also said that his dress sense hadn't improved over the first two and a half years. But what has the response to all of this been from our own political class? 
from the Labour Party, from the Lib Dems, we hear almost nothing. But the most enthusiastic cheerleaders in the whole of the European Union, the guys that have been urging the abolition of democracy, the guys that have been urging that anything and everything must be done to preserve a failing Euro, have of course been David Cameron and George Osborne. They're the guys that are pushing this. They're the guys that are pushing this. They're the guys that are happy for British taxpayers' money to be used through the back door of the International Monetary Fund to bail out a currency and countries that in the end are going to go bust anyway. And our message ahead of this big IMF debate must be that as far as we're concerned, not a penny more of British taxpayers' money should go towards those bailouts. Now, within Mr Cameron's party, there are some mixed views, and I saw a lovely spectacle when Mario Monti came to the European Parliament to speak, to tell us that everything was fine, there was no need to worry about democracy, the good guys were now in charge, and at the end of his speech, I watched the British Tory MEPs. Some of them stood and joined in a standing ovation to the puppet Prime Minister from Italy. Others sat and applauded quietly. And to my right, Roger Helmer sat unmoved and continued reading the Daily Express. <laughs> so no one seems to care. And, it, and, and really, it is UKIP, not just in this country, but in the European Parliament and right across the European Union. We are the party making the arguments. We want to live and work in a Europe of trade, of cooperation. We want to be good next door neighbours, but we do not want to be run by people like Barroso and Van Rompuy. We want a Europe of nation states. And we've been right about all of these things, and we will go on being right, and we will go on fighting, not just in this country, but when the Irish have the referendum, we will help the No campaign in Ireland too. We, you know, it's not just about Britain being independent, it's about the whole of the continent being independent, democratic and free, and they're the values that we're going to fight for. And I also think that one of the reasons that UKIP has done so well in 2011 and into this year is we're becoming a very much more positive party. We're telling people what we're for, not just what we're against. We're explaining to people that we are the party that believes in free enterprise, that believes in business, that we're the party that recognises that the four million self-employed and sole traders in this country are the heroes of the nation for all that they do and need the weight of government regulation lifted off their backs. <laughs> and we're the party that believes in liberty. We're the party that believes that you're big enough and ugly enough to make your own mind up. And if the local pub wants to have a smoking room at the back, if you want to go out and hunt foxes on Saturday afternoons, that is your business and not the business of the state. So we're a party that campaigns for democracy. We're a party that campaigns for liberty. We're a positive political party. And we're seeing new, fresh people joining the party all the time. Indeed, there are one or two new people who might be joining the party today, I understand. But I want, before I introduce our newest members, just to say a word, if I can, about one of our recently departed members. Today in Belfast, there is a big funeral taking place for the late great comedian Frank Carson. Frank, as you will know, Frank, as you will know, was a passionate supporter of UKIP. What appealed to him about UKIP is that it was a patriotic party, but that it was absolutely a non-racist and non-sectarian political organisation. And Frank did tremendous work for us, and I think really helped to get us out to an audience that perhaps hadn't seen us before. And I remember the first time I met him, and he was like a walking joke machine, you know. And, and so I met Frank, and uh, he said, hello, good to meet you, pleased to be with you, pleased to be supporting your European election campaign. He said, you never guess what? He said, on the way here today, he said, you wouldn't believe it, but after a gap of nearly 60 years, I met my old Sergeant Major from the Parachute Regiment. And he reminded me of the occasion when I was there on parade, an 18-year-old recruit, and the Sergeant Major came down my line and he said, Carson, I didn't see you on camouflage practice this morning, 
To which I replied, thank you, sir. <laughs> now, one, I thought it was a very good, and it never stopped. It kept on going, you know. So, Frank, rest in peace. Now, one of the things that we've been doing rather well, we've been attracting, we've been attracting a lot of very good young people into UKIP. You know, this idea that the views that we stand for are somehow desperately outdated and that we're little Englanders, well, we're giving lie to that with the growth of young independence. And I want to introduce you to a new member, and she's joined the party today. Her name is Alexandra Swan. She's 23 years old. She's been a political activist since the age of 14. She was involved in Conservative Future at Exeter. She's been the Surrey Chairman of Conservative Future. And until very recently, she was the National Deputy Chair of Conservative Future. I'm very pleased to say that the Swan has now migrated to UKIP. Alexandra, you're welcome. <laughs> right, as I, as I told a few people last night, I despise public speaking, so this might be short. But thank you so much, Nigel. And thank you to everyone I've met this weekend who's been so lovely to me, and to Young Independents who've made me feel so incredibly welcome and so happy to have made this decision. After nearly 10 years in Conservative Future, it feels brilliant to not be censored. It's wonderful. <laughs> Until very recently, I was National Deputy Chairman of Conservative Future, and um, I became interested in politics around the age of 10, when my father explained to me the insanity and the injustice of progressive income tax. I just thought it was absolutely abhorrent that the more you work and the more you do, the more you pay. It just seemed wrong. Um, yeah. um, I started campaigning for Conservatives about 14. I joined the party at 16, when the Islington class warriors took away our freedom to hunt. And until October, as I said, I was Deputy Chairman of Conservative Future. Um, I've always been a conservative because I believe in a small state. I'm doing my PhD in Herbert Spencer and 19th century libertarianism, and he had the right idea. There was a coming slavery, and we have it right now. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I still believe that the best way for a country to flourish is through low taxation, pro-business policies, strong defence, national sovereignty, but most of all, a, a small state that only works within its proper sphere. But these, but these are no longer the views of the modern Conservative Party. Cameron is as true a Conservative as Belgium is a real country. <laughs> um, I didn't come to criticise Cameron. I think he's doing whatever he can in a terrible and difficult situation, and I, I stand by that. But as he has noted kindly, in fact, in The Guardian, but um, this time last weekend, I had the, the pleasure, or the, or the displeasure, of joining my father for a drink in Farnham Conservative Club in the most sorry of sorry heartlands of conservatism of South West Surrey. <laughs> and talking to a few members there, it made it abundantly clear the dissatisfaction and the feelings of betrayal amongst conservative voters and conservative activists is not limited to a few libertarians and the Young Britons Foundation and a few fruit cakes and nut jobs on the right. It is really strongly felt by a lot of young conservatives and there are a lot of us who will be joining UKIP soon. I mean, the fact that more happens it shocks me, as it is. Um, but Central Office will have you believe that the party is all on the same message. And for a lot of Conservatives, I couldn't look myself in the mirror anymore and call myself Conservative, and that's why I've come to UKIP. Um, <laughs> traditional, traditional Conservatives of all ages feeling strongly alienated by this Liberal Democrat-led, business-hating government that have become so consumed by EU-driven, climate-change fascism. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, fuel prices are soaring, living costs are soaring, and our countryside is being destroyed by wind farms. Cameron has repeatedly denied us a referendum. We've had countless promises, guarantees, every type of iron, cast iron guarantees. We've still had no referendum. And it seems that despite the efforts of so many activists before the last general election, including myself and a lot of friends of mine, this government is about as conservative-led as the EU as a successful democratic institution. <laughs> um, I think we need 
huge change, huge change that Liberal, Labour, Conservative cannot bring us, but UKIP can. Yeah. But what I truly think we need to do is we need to tap into disaffected voters and we need to shut up about Europe because we've won that battle. Everyone knows we want to be out of Europe and I think there are about five people left in the country that want to be in Europe. Nick Clegg, like David Cameron and three Greens probably. <laughs> no one wants it anymore. But everyone knows that that's what we stand for and what they don't know is that we have the soundest policies on taxation and education of any party and we're probably the only one that actually takes our monstrous debt seriously. I think what we need is, you know, we need to get out there that we, you know, we have a simple, fair taxes, a tax policy that would not only make you know, a fair, non-progressive taxation, but would take the poorest out of income tax altogether. It would... <laughs> we, need tax, we need this tax burden removed from individuals and from businesses because we are harming our, you know, our, our removal from this ridiculous recession by taxing people into submission. And we need to take the debt seriously and make real cuts, not slight reductions in spending like we are right now. I think what we really, the main thing, as I said, UKIP needs to do is talk about our policies such as taxation in grammar schools and defence. And we need to tell people that UKIP is probably the only party that can be trusted to defend its people, whether that's through retaining our nuclear deterrent, whether we safeguard against crime rather than bureaucracy, or whether we put the human rights of British people for the apparent rights of convicted terrorists and illegal immigrants. <laughs> I think everyone here knows how well we did in the last elections, and I only wish I'd been a part of it then. Uh, sorry, European elections. But what we really need to do is capitalise on the success to get out all of our policies, to make people listen to us, because I think the British people are starting to listen. And they're starting to, I mean, People, are people have lost faith in a lot of Westminster. Conservatives have lost faith in Cameron, and I, I truly don't think that's the fault of the man himself, it's the situation he's in, but they're not true conservative values anymore, like they were with Thatcher. The EU is crumbling around us, thank God, and support for withdrawal has never been stronger. What we really need to do is get across the country and remove the smoke screen that's been placed by the liberal left media that UKIP is a far right party, like the far left BNP, because we're not. UKIP is a party of liberty, of small state, and of individuals. And what we really need to push is that UKIP does not just stand for UK independence from Europe, but it's independence from the massive nanny state. It's independence from political correctness. It's independence from our monstrous tax burden. It's independence for the individual. And for that reason, I am so proud to be a member, and thank you so much for having me. Well, Alexandra, thank you very much indeed. And if you're starting to even use my Belgian lines, I better watch my step, hadn't I? <laughs> now, when Steve was planning this conference, um, I did say to him, I want you to leave me a slightly longer slot than normal because I'm hoping to have a guest speaker. In fact, the next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, I've hoped to have along as a guest speaker for many, many years. Um, we've done very well to keep it as secret as we have. Uh, but the Twitter sphere was going slightly berserk last night uh, when people saw Roger Helmer walking in and sitting down next to me at dinner. <laughs> Roger has been a businessman, has got experience of life in the real world. He served as an MEP since 1999 for the Conservatives. He is hardworking, he is driven, he is honest, he is straightforward, he's somebody that all of us in UKIP have admired for many, many years. I believe that Roger joining UKIP today is going to be a huge asset to this party because the, the, the activists in the Conservative Party all over the country support Roger and support many of his campaigns. I believe this is in fact a very big moment for UKIP and I want you please to give a huge, huge welcome to our newest member, Roger Helmer.
Ladies and gentlemen, it is great to be here with you today in Skegness. And can I please remind you that Skegness is the premier seaside resort of this East Midlands region that Derek Clark and I are proud to represent. I'm not sure about proud of the European Parliament, but we're proud to represent the East Midlands. Now you could say that I had to come to the UKIP Spring Conference because of course the Conservative Spring Conference was cancelled owing to lack of interest. <laughs> I'd like, I'd like to thank you all for that fantastic welcome, and especially I would like to thank UKIP's leader, Nigel Farage. I've known Nigel for a very long time. Um, we used to go hair coursing together, the Waterloo Cup at Alt Car. Um, we used to meet, uh, meet over a beer there and, uh, and uh, watch the uh, greyhounds going after the hare, till unfortunately uh, hunting was banned. Um, but we still see a fair bit of each other in the European Parliament. Uh, and I love to listen to him in the Parliament. You've seen the, uh, the video clips. Um, I actually see it in the flesh, uh, and it is great uh, to watch. I would also like to thank many of you who, over the years, have written to me and said, what are you doing, Helmer, in the Conservative Party? You ought to be joining UKIP. And for years and years, I've written back and said, what would be the use of the Conservative Party if all the Eurosceptics left it? Uh, don't you think we ought to have some Eurosceptics trying to move the Conservative Party in the right direction? Now, I've been a member of the Conservative Party on and off since I left university, and I hate to tell you how many years that is, but it's a lot of years. And I have been a Conservative member of the European Parliament since 1999. Um, I'm a member, by the way, of the Unemployment Committee, as is Derek. Uh, and I have to tell you, the Unemployment Committee in the European Parliament is doing a great job. It's generated a hell of a lot of unemployment. <laughs> but I finally, I finally realized uh, that pushing water uphill is not a good way to live. Uh, I have tried and tried to get a bit of common sense into the Conservative Party. Uh, I have finally given up on that objective and move to a party full of people who actually believe what I believe, and that is a great place to be. Okay, Helmer, you may say, what do you believe? Well, I believe in freedom and democracy. I believe in liberty and personal responsibility. I believe in enterprise and free markets. I believe in low taxes and limited government. I believe in family and nation. And I believe that that is what you believe too. Yeah. That <laughs> that, is what, that is what our American colleagues call Jeffersonian principles. But I have to tell you, I think it is just common sense. Now, haven't we heard some great speeches already here today? Yes. I thought Tim Congdon's presentation on the economics was absolutely spot on. He said, <laughs> he said many of the things that uh, I've been trying to say, but he said it with a clarity, I think, that was wonderful, and he's absolutely right. We must get that message to the British people. We may have joined the common market, as it was called, for the sake of prosperity, but after, what is it now, nearly 40 years, we have to admit that we got it wrong and it isn't delivering those results. But if Tim Congdon gave a great presentation, well, what about a Alexandra Swan? My word. I tell you what, she proves that it's not just grumpy old men like me who want to leave the Conservative Party and join UKIP. It's exceptionally bright young people like her. And when I heard that she was going to be here, I was absolutely delighted. Now, Alexandra, you were very courteous about David Cameron. And of course, I wouldn't dream of being rude about him. But we've already heard mentioned several times the famous cast iron guarantee. Sun newspaper, September 2007, if I remember, a cast iron guarantee. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. When it comes to the point, 
oh, well, of course, but the treaty's been ratified, so there's no point in having a referendum now, is there? Have you ever heard a weaker excuse? Promises, promises, and then we get the manifestos for the last general election. Guarantee of a referendum on the European issue. Did it happen? No, it didn't. It's worse than that. Not only did the referendum not happen, but actually when there was a vote in Westminster calling for a referendum, what happened? Cameron's Conservatives whipped their own MPs to vote against a referendum, despite the fact, despite the fact that it, was in, it had been in their manifesto. And it's not only in Westminster. We also had a Conservative manifesto commitment to oppose the European Diplomatic Service, the European External Action Service, as they call it. That was our party policy, to oppose it. Now, we had a vote on this question in the European Parliament, and I was sitting there looking at the list. You know, we all have lists of how we have to vote. You may say, why don't you make the decisions decision by decision, one at a time? But when you're voting on 800 amendments in the course of an hour and a half, you really don't have time to read them and make a decision. You do need a little guidance. But where there is an important vote, as for example on the diplomatic service, uh, we usually check in advance and we know where it's going to come. And I was looking down, I knew where it was. And we were whipped to vote in favour of the European diplomatic service. And I turned round to Charles Tannock, who's our foreign affairs spokesman. At least they regard the European Union as foreign. I suppose that's something. <laughs> I, I turned round to him, I turned round to him and I said, we got the vote wrong here, we're supposed to be voting against. Oh no, he said. Westminster has asked us to vote in favour. So that was another turnaround. Let's take another commitment. When we had the coalition agreement, it was extremely difficult for the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats to agree about anything with regard to Europe. There was only one thing. They agreed that both Conservative and Liberal Democrat would oppose, would oppose the famous travelling circus the uh, monthly movement of the European Parliament between Brussels and Strasbourg, which, as I'm sure you all know, costs uh, about £200 million a year. At least they had the common sense to say in the coalition agreement that they would oppose that. So when a group of MEPs in the Parliament managed to get a decision made by the Parliament, not to stop it, but to cut it down from 12 times a year to 11 times a year, and when the French government, trying to defend Strasbourg, took the European Parliament to court, and when there was an opportunity for member states to make representations to the court for or against, and a couple of member states supported France, was our coalition government there on behalf of the UK saying, no, we've got to stop this nonsense and this waste? No, they sat on their hands. When I inquired afterwards why they had done so, you know the reason was, well, we thought it was a bad time to upset the French. <laughs> Do you think there is anybody there in the Quai d'Orsay who is sitting around saying, let's not upset the British? I don't think, I don't think that's the case. But if we look at Cameron on the issues, on Europe he is, or has been, effectively a complete sellout. I sat opposite him in a room with the Conservative delegation about seven or eight months ago. He came to visit us in his capacity as Prime Minister. And um, we each had an opportunity to do a question. It wasn't really a debate because the time was limited, but a quick question. I said, Prime Minister, I said, the Conservatives who selected me and supported me and campaigned for me in the East Midlands, they think we ought to have a referendum on Europe. What about it? And he said, no, he said, I don't want a referendum on Europe because we are better off in. That is his position. And if you think about it, he is wrong twice. Of course we're not better off in. I don't have to argue that case here. But also, why do you have referendums? You do not have them to confirm the prejudices of the Prime Minister. You have them because you want to give the British people an opportunity to have their say. This is, this is a Prime Minister who has told very clearly, he's told very clearly his backbenchers that if they support leaving the European Union, if they sign up to better off out, they can remain Conservative MPs, but they will never get promotion, they will never get uh, a, a hand on the slippery pole. So you've got really good sound guys like Douglas Carswell, who has no hope of ever making any progress through the ranks of the Conservative Parliamentary Party, because he believes, as we believe, uh, that we are better off out. But it, it is, 
Well, you talk to him about that. Uh, <laughs> it isn't just Europe, and a lot of people have made the point today, quite rightly, that UKIP is still seen out there by many people, especially in the media, as a single issue party. And Alexandra was again quite right. She says it's important, in my view, if I can, as a brand new today member of UKIP, if I can offer a word of advice, um, we do need to think about broadening that out so people stop saying to us in radio interviews, but you're a single issue party. Okay, we're not. Let's take another issue. Uh, that is climate and energy. Now, my big issue for the whole of my parliamentary career, obviously, has been Europe and, and Britain's position in Europe and getting Britain out. But over the last five years or so, a huge issue for me has been the whole question of climate and energy policy. I had a conference in Brussels. I had um, uh, Lord Lawson and I had uh, Professor Fred Singer, an American uh, um, atmospheric physicist, uh, and a group of other luminaries of the climate skeptic uh, uh, campaign. And I had them in Brussels. We had a session there that was very successful. And since then, I've been campaigning uh, on this issue. I got a confession to make. I am what the Guardian newspaper calls a climate change denier. Of course, I'm not a climate change denier. Anybody who denies the plain fact that the climate changes would have to be mad. The climate has always changed. It will always change. The question is, why does it change? The reason they call me a denier is because in my personal view, and I'm not a scientist, I used to be a mathematician, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I have read the uh, available research in considerable detail, in my view, human activity has little or no impact on the climate. And, and therefore, the things we are doing are essentially pretty much a waste of time. But I want you to do a little thought experiment for me. Just set aside your view, if you share my view. Let's set that aside a moment. Let's assume that CO2 emissions are a threat to the planet. What would you try and do? What you would try and do is you would say, let us find a way of reducing CO2 emissions as efficiently as possible, as low cost as possible, doing the least possible damage to the economy. That's what you would do. Now, the problems start, as so many problems start, of course, with Brussels. Brussels has decided that we're going to have targets for renewables. Well, why renewables? Why not low carbon generation, in which case nuclear would be on the same level as wind farms, and by the way, as we all know, energy from uh, nuclear power stations is a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, but we don't do that. We actually say, no, we're going to use renewables. Nobody's explained why we use renewables in preference, say, to other low carbon technologies, but that's what they say. And I don't need to talk to you about wind farms. We all know what's wrong with them. Uh, recent research is indicating that they probably save almost zero CO2 because, as you know, they're intermittent. You have to back them up, usually with gas. Gas run intermittently to back up wind is itself inefficient, generates more CO2 than you need to, and costs more than you need to. And you're building the capacity twice. I say to people who want to build wind farms, you'll need the gas backup capacity. Why not just build the gas and forget about the wind farms? But recently, recently, 100 plus members of parliament in Westminster wrote to the Prime Minister asking him to reconsider the policy on green energy and green energy subsidies. And um, uh, he wrote back a letter. And by the way, I and other colleagues also wrote a supporting letter, which was published in the Telegraph last week. I don't know whether you happened to, to notice it. Cameron wrote back, and indeed he very kindly sent me a copy of the, of the letter, in which he said that despite European Union rules, even without European Union rules, we would still want wind farms as part of our energy mix uh, because they delivered energy security and because they created green jobs. Now, is that ignorance or pig-headedness or what is it? They do not deliver energy security because we will not build all the 30,000 wind turbines that Chris Hoon, God bless him, wanted to build. We will fail to build them, but if we plan on their availability, uh, then we will be short of electricity, and we're not building the backup, so we'll be short of electricity anyway. The current plan, making a high proportion of British electricity generation dependent upon wind farms, is a guarantee of power outages and shortages and blackouts by the end of the decade. It is madness. 
There is just no excuse for that policy. But just as with Europe, Cameron doesn't engage with the debate. He just says, oh, well, Europe's important for trade. Similarly with wind farms, Cameron does not engage with the debate. He doesn't, either doesn't know or hasn't bothered to find out. We know, by the way, that green jobs are not created by wind farms. Uh, there are several pieces of research showing that one green job costs two or three real jobs in the real economy because the high cost of green renewable electricity depresses economic growth. And in any case, a great part of the equipment for these renewable energy projects is actually made in China anyway. So, uh, you know, if we want to, uh, to give money to China, well, that's a great thing, but we're giving enough money away in foreign aid as things are. <laughs> I talked about Europe. I've talked about Europe, I've talked about energy, uh, which for me is a key policy. By the way, I don't want you to run away with the idea that I don't care about the environment. I feel I've done my bit. I actually went as far as I bought a green car. <laughs> British Racing Green. <laughs> and I enjoyed burning the gas on the way up here from Leicestershire, I tell you. But it's not just those two issues, it's a load of other issues. It's defence. I won't go into it because I, we could talk for half an hour about defence. It's foreign aid that's been raised already and I can sense the mood of the meeting. It's immigration that's already been covered. There are a whole load of tax issues where they've got it completely wrong. It's the lack of a growth strategy and a lack of a deregulation policy. It's university admissions, it's grammar schools, it's transport policy. And I got to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, when I said to myself, which bit of conservative policy do I support? I think IDS is doing some pretty good things with welfare. I think Gove is doing some fairly good things with schools, although the university thing worries me and the grammar schools thing. But on the great broad picture of policy, I found I was unable to support the Conservative Party. And I think it was at that point that I decided to make a move. But that's my story and that's history. Let's look at the future. Again, we've heard from earlier speakers that there is a change of mood amongst the British public, and that is clear. I think five years ago, my colleagues, my Conservative colleagues, were, were telling me, Helmer, you're obsessed with Europe. Now, you go out and do the research. Ask voters what they think matters. They care about immigration. They care about jobs. They care about health. They care about pensions. They care about education. They don't care about Europe. It's item 12, 13, 14, 15, way down the list. And of course, I replied that, as we all know, Europe may be number 12 on the list for the voters, but in fact, Europe, Brussels, affects all those items on the top of the list. But my colleagues had a point. Europe wasn't top of mind as an issue for, uh, for the average British voter. So perhaps we should be grateful for the Euro, because the Euro crisis has been top of the news agenda, it seems, almost every night for the last two years. There is always another emergency. The Panjandrums in Brussels always make a decision too little, too late. Again and again we hear, if they made this decision a year ago, it might have solved the problem. But they let it slide and they let it slide. And they now face a situation where they cannot get it right because they cannot bring themselves to admit that the problem is not the failure of Greece to report its numbers correctly, is not that France and Germany broke the Maastricht limits, it's not the lack of a new treaty imposing German-style austerity on the rest of Europe. The problem is the euro itself. And as long as they have the euro itself, they will not solve the problem. But that gives UKIP the opportunity that we have needed. Suddenly, Europe is no longer way, way down the list. Europe is in everybody's mind. The public is now aware of it, it looks at it every night on television, and it does not like what it sees. And obviously the big opportunity for all of us is going to be the 2014 Euro election. I have to share one little insight on that with you from my good friend and colleague Dan Hannan, who said he thought maybe the 2014 European election wouldn't take place, and that if it did it would certainly be the last one in this country. Um, I suspect he may be right at that. But it is a huge opportunity. Last time, UKIP came second, beating Labour into third place. That was an incredible achievement. The objective, surely next time, must actually be to beat the Conservatives into second place and see UKIP come third.
As you know, I was selected and elected by East Midlands Conservatives three times over the course of my parliamentary history. They agree with what I am saying. They do not agree with what David Cameron is doing. And I believe, therefore, that I will have a role to play working with you in that campaign to get the UKIP message across. If I can... If I can just say in conclusion, I believe that the British people have the ability and the right and the duty and the manifest destiny to govern themselves in an independent and democratic country. That is where the future is. I was born in the closing years of the Second World War, while Britain was marching on to victory against one of the worst tyrannies of the 20th century, a tyranny, by the way, based in Berlin. I was born, I was born into a Britain that was free and independent and democratic. And ladies and gentlemen, all I ask is the right to die in a Britain that is free and independent and democratic. I said he was good, didn't I? <laughs> now, not only has Roger become a member of the party today, but he has also agreed to accept the role as our spokesman for industry and with specific regard to Britain's beleaguered manufacturing industry, which is suffering so terribly with the carbon trading <laughs> rate. So thank you, Roger. Our battle isn't just against the EU. Our battle, if you think about it, really, is against the political class in this country who've sold us down the river, but not just to the EU. Not just to the EU. I want to highlight, for those that perhaps haven't seen it, the recent extradition case of a businessman, a retired businessman, called Christopher Tappin. Now, I have to declare an interest in this. I've, I've known Chris Tappin for nearly 40 years, for nearly the whole of my life. Uh, we live close to each other, we're members of the same golf club. I knew his father, I know his wife, I know the children. So he is a friend of mine. And I do very much take the view that a businessman, successful businessman, living in a big detached house, whose children have left home and are doing well, I take the view that a businessman in that position would not have risked everything on a transaction that stood to make him the handsome sum of $500. To me, it doesn't make sense. But actually, folks, the issue isn't whether Mr. Tappin has or has not done anything wrong. The issue is that a 65-year-old retired businessman who has never been in trouble with the law for the whole of his life in this country, indeed, he's only ever had one speeding ticket throughout his whole adult life, the issue is that that man has been extradited to America without at any opportunity being able to present his side of the argument and without the American authorities producing any prima facie evidence at all. And that overturns every single good, decent principle of British justice that we have enjoyed since Magna Carta. And I put it to you that Tappin's extradition is an abomination. I'm also concerned about the judicial system that he's going to. You know, I used to think of America as being the land of the free. But I'm afraid that when those towers came down, and when George Bush said he was going to launch a war on terror, that that has in fact now become a war on liberty. And the plea bargaining system in America is such that you're put into prisons that are gang-ridden, that are violent, that are brutal, and certainly no way that we would ever consider putting people in prison. You're put in those conditions, and you're faced with a choice under a plea bargaining system. You're told 
that you may well not get to court for four years. So you'll spend the next four years on remand in one of these brutal prisons. You're told that your legal fees will be between one and two million dollars. And you're told that if the jury finds against you, you face life imprisonment. Or you'll be told under a plea bargaining system, if you plead guilty, you'll just get two years and then we'll let you go. Does that sound like a fair judicial system? Yes, well, that is the world, that is the world that my friend Chris Tappin now finds himself in. He's in just the most impossible position. I spoke to his wife on Thursday. Um, he is being kept at the moment in a cell on his own. They've removed his books and his reading material. He's allowed out of the cell for two hours a day, but the lights are kept on for 24 hours a day. We're talking about really unpleasant and brutal conditions. It is quite wrong. But what have our government done about this? Worse than nothing. Worse than nothing. In opposition, the Conservatives made the point that this treaty was wrong. And of course, George Bush said to Tony Blair, jump, and he said how high, didn't he? So we went to war in Iraq and we signed this extradition treaty. David Blunkett, who was the Home Secretary at the time, has now said that the treaty was wrong, that it was a mistake, and it needs to be changed. The Cameron government, in opposition, promised to change it. I have repeatedly begged Theresa May, the Home Secretary, to contact the US Justice Department and to say to them, would they please drop their objection to bail on the basis that this man has never had a criminal record and that this man does not constitute a flight risk. He's not the sort of guy that's going to do a runner. She's done nothing. And when the Prime Minister, when the Prime Minister was questioned in PMQs two weeks ago, he gave the most utterly disingenuous answer. He said, you must remember that in Mr Tappin's case, he was heard at a magistrate's court and at the High Court. Yes, Prime Minister, but without any prima facie evidence of any kind being put forward. And so Cameron, giving the impression that this has been through fair process, frankly, I think is a disgrace. But the all-time low on this was when William Hague was interviewed on this question. It was at the end of an interview about Syria, and he was asked on the day the extradition took place, what about Mr Tappin's case? And Hague said, I'm too busy for that. And he turned his back and he walked away. And what the British political class have done to freedom, democracy and liberty in this country is they have collectively turned their backs and walked away. Shame on them. So I am, I am today launching an e-petition on the Downing Street website and I ask you all please to sign that petition, to get your friends to sign that petition. Cameron goes to Washington on the 13th of March to meet Obama and we're demanding that the Prime Minister raises this issue in two weeks time and that we renegotiate this treaty so that evidence of some kind must be put before a British judge and I hope, UKIP, that you will help me and support me in this campaign. Thank you. We've got a big year coming up. We've got the London Assembly elections, where I look at a list of candidates in their 30s and 40s, many from very good professional backgrounds. We've got by-elections that will come up for Westminster. We've got local elections to fight. We are an electoral party. We are making progress. I think this party has matured incredibly in the course of the next couple of years. And Alexandra, I'm listening and I understand We've got a campaign on a broad series of fronts. I think we're beginning to do that. And with people like Alexandra and our new industry spokesman who've joined us today, I think the only way is up. Have a great conference. Thank you.